Good morning. I'm Hugh Hardy, an architect and an ancient board member of MAS. And it's such a pleasure to see it fulfilling its promise with this summit. Uh, I've been associated with uh, ideas about the future of Penn Station since Monaghan first had the idea that the tracks that run under the Farley Post Office are the same tracks that go under Penn Station itself, the same platforms, and couldn't that Bozar remnant become a new gateway? Uh, it's an extraordinary place, Penn Station, and it survives in memory more than reality. Uh, and isn't it strange to go there into that cavern, ill-lit cavern, and find photographs proudly on the walls of what used to be there? And the, the, the discontinuity between nostalgia and reality is preposterous. Do you know that every day, and maybe I'm interrupting someone else's presentation, but it has to be understood that more people go in and out of Penn Station than all three airports combined. That's preposterous that a great city would have what it now has. Uh, th it contains four different railroads. Think about it. There's the MTA. Think of all the people who go it by subway. There is Amtrak, which is theoretically a proud gateway to a great city. There is New Jersey Transit, which, as you know, is in the process of, you will hear, building, perhaps, a new tunnel. It won't end up in Penn Station, though, and that's an interesting subject. Uh, and the Long Island Railroad. They all come there, and they all uh, somehow are able to get all those bodies in and out. It's a somewhat terrifying experience, but amazingly enough, being New York, it uh, really does work. But instead of just talking about change, it's actually happening. There was, earlier in the week, a groundbreaking ceremony for the first part of a major plan to Im improve the whole complex. Uh, it's going to include new access from 8th Avenue at street level. It's going to include changes in the concourse. It's going to include uh, uh, all kinds of small but essential possibilities for movement. And it's the beginning of a larger idea about how the Farley Post Office would be transformed into Monaghan Station. Uh, it's it's an astonishing idea because it includes planning, urban planning, very, very important aspect of this city, historic preservation. You can't imagine thinking that it could be thrown away. The throwing away of the original Penn Station, of course, led to the Landmarks Commission and a long story. It's about transportation policy. It's more than just a few railroads. Uh, it, it influences the whole region in transportation. It's about economic development. Somehow the original station never did transform the west side as it was supposed to, and now there are forces at work that might make that possible. So when you put that all together, this is a big, big topic. Uh, our panel today is gonna to be chaired by someone whom I don't need to introduce because Vince Apola has been introduced over and over and it is the mastermind behind what is being achieved over these two days. And so, Vin, there you are. Next to Vin is, I think, Tim Gilchrist. Yes, it is true. Who is the president of the Bonahan Station Development Corporation. It's a subsidy of Empire State Development. It's interesting in these matters when you get to a large urban scale that the state is, is much a, has got its hands and feet all over New York City as much as, and, and we really cannot operate independently from the state. And of course, when great grants come from Congress to take care of lower Manhattan, they go through the state to get to the city. Uh, the state is our partner, of course. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Tim has an impressive background in public service because he served as the Governor Patterson's senior advisor for transportation and infrastructure, he's knowledgeable. He's the chair of the New York State Economic Recovery and Reinvention Cabinet, reinvestment, well it's reinvention, cabinet, and the deputy secretary for economic development and infrastructure. 
Uh, next is Tom Wright, who is the executive director of the Regional Plan Association. This is the nation's oldest private regional planning organization. And I might also add one, it's not just old, it's effective. <laughs> like MAS, RPA has been a staunch advocate for the development of Monaghan Station and has offered enthusiastic support for the crucial phase of the project, which has begun. It's begun. It's just, we're not just going to have a lot of windy talk about what might be. It's begun. We're going to discuss how it can be achieved and how we can make it better. Uh, he is a visiting lecturer in public policy at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Then we have... Kent Barwick, citizen of New York, <laughs> who is, anyone who lives in the great city knows how important Kent is to the cultural life of the place. Uh, he was the uh, executive director of MAS from 1970 to 1975, and he personally was responsible for the campaign to save Grand Central. Oh, how we'd all love to tell that story right now, but you've heard it before. <laughs> and uh, he was also served as president of MAS from 1983 until 1995, and from 1999 through 2009. So he is MAS complete to the core. Uh, but he's interestingly involved with so many other aspects of the city, and a favorite of mine is his participation in the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. It's this generation that's changing the relationship of the city to the waterfront. And that's an astonishing transformation. I believe it's as important uh, for the future of the city as what Moses did with all his roads and parks combined. Uh, Vishan, Vishan Chakabarti is a, a Mark Holiday Halliday Professor and Director of Real Estate Development at the Graduate School in Pres Planning and Preservation for Columbia University. Vishan also leads VCDC, an urban design and development firm through which he consults the development of Monaghan Station. Uh, he was part of, he has inner knowledge about how the whole thing works. May I just give your team, when he was in private practice, credit for bringing the four railroads together in a development scheme about Penn Station, and as you will hear, there have been many ideas, uh, Vishan's group actually got those four railroads to talk together. They had never done it before, although they all worked and depended upon one another to get all those millions of people in and out of the place. They never had talked to each other, and so that's a major achievement to be able to advance the project. Uh, he is also He's now president, he has been president of the Monaghan Station Venture, that's that era, and he was the director of the Manhattan Office for New York Department of City Planning. What a panel! <laughs> Vin, take it away. Okay, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. I just want to also recognize Peter Davidson, executive director of ESDC. A little bit of a connection and involvement there to this topic. I am not Charles Bagley, but I do have access to his questions. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes, guys. It goes, guys. All right. We have a truly wonderful panel with a tremendous breadth of experience with and knowledge about the development of this very important project. So what I'd like to do quickly is touch on MAS's own background with Moynihan Station, briefly outline our discussion, and then jump right in. And for fellow allergy sufferers, I am loaded up with lozenges, so don't. Just raise your hand and I'll get the cue. Uh, last month, we remembered what would have been the, 11th, the 100th anniversary of the original Pennsylvania Station. And uh, I happened to be, uh, during that anniversary, at the existing Penn Station, where I often can be found. It was impossible uh, not to recall Vincent Scully's observation that in the past, one entered New York City like a god and one scuttles in uh, like a rat. Uh, replacing a Beau Art, Beau Arts masterpiece with a subterranean mess of uh, low ceilings and dark tunnels was, to put it mildly, a terrible mistake. Uh, writing that wrong is not only an amazing opportunity, it is the duty of all New Yorkers who care about the future of their city. 
Uh, MAS has been working to realize Senator Moynihan's vision for a new station for almost two decades, and we've long maintained that this is the most important project on the city's horizon. Restoring the sense of place that once emanated from Penn Station is, of course, a worthy goal, but it is not our only goal. By working towards the development of Moynihan Station, we are advocating for the development of its surrounding district, the very district that we are in with the summit, and for recognition of the primacy of public transportation to an ever-growing New York. We are insisting that Moynihan Station is the cornerstone on which the far west side must be built, and that its completion is a necessary first step in unlocking Manhattan's last frontier, the benefits of which will be internalized throughout the entire city. Ultimately, we are demonstrating that intelligent urban planning can incorporate the beautiful, the profitable, and the wise. So looking forward, and that's what this summit is all about, looking forward, we're going to talk about what's next for Moynihan and what's next for the far west side of Manhattan. Hugh introduced this very terrific panel to you, and now I'll forecast to the extent that I can what we're going to hear today. First, we have Tim Gilchrist, who is president of the Moynihan Station Development Corporation to talk about the next steps in the development and maybe to comment on some of the hurdles that he expects us to meet to best in the coming years. After Tim will be Tom uh, from the Regional Plan Association and he'll, Tom will speak to us about the impact that Moynihan will have on regional transportation and help us sort through the various rail carriers who will utilize Moynihan Station. My friend Kent Barwick will follow Tom Wright with a discussion of how Moynihan fits within the wider development of the Far West Side, an issue that is of great importance to MAS and has been for quite some time. And following Kent, Vishan Chakrabarty will help us to consider the essentiality of projects like Moynihan Station to the future of New York City and then getting back to this project specifically, comment on the impact of the station in terms of economic development on New York City. And without further ado, Tim, I'd like to turn it over to you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thanks to, you know, um, for ho everybody hosting this event and inviting us here today. Um, Moynihan Station Development Corporation, while it's a, a state entity, also is um, governed by a board that's made up of New York State, um, New York City, and the federal government. So all of the really involved parties are are in here. Um, I think we all know where Moynihan Station is across the street from us here. Um, and as we move this development, maybe we should all move out the side. That what we're doing in this first phase is we're putting in $100 million, approximately $100 million, in simply in ventilation plants that are hopefully never used except for testing in case of a fire in the building. The West End Concourse, which currently only serves a few of the platforms and only serves Long Island Railroad, which are basically underneath the steps of the post office, is going to add over 17,000 square feet and be doubled in size and doubled in, in width and in length so that it will serve all of the platforms and all of the customers can use it. We're going to provide 16 more access points to the platforms to um, alleviate the overcrowding, especially in the morning and the evening rush when you're queuing for often 10 minutes to get off of those platforms. And we're going to provide entrances from Moynihan Station at the corners of 31st and 33rd Street on 8th Avenue that will allow you direct access down into the West End Concourse. This was all work that was part of any of the proposals that have come forward in the past and is the necessary work to be in place so that we can put this grand intermodal hall. Here we go. There we are. Um, as you can see in the, the area that in, in the reddish shade shows the doubling of the, um, the doubling of the, the West End concourse moving through and the new entrances that are coming off of um, 31st and 33rd Street where there's currently moats that, um, that served as early ventilation for the, for the train station as we move forward there. And then, <coughs> as you can see, we'll have the grand entrances into Moynihan Station in those moat areas as we move forward. Um, a modern entrance that will eventually lead into the grand train hall behind the postal facilities. The West End Concourse, which is now quite narrow and dingy. No, Helena Williams isn't here, is she, from Long Island Railroad? 
um, will be opened up so that it, it, it can better serve all of the passengers. In fact, it's so cramped right now that Long Island Railroad is unable to put ticket vending machines in there because there's really not room for a, a queuing in the access. And then we'll move to the Grand Train Hall that is, is part of the original plan and the agreement that we reached in February with Amtrak for them to move, re recommit and, and really commit this time to moving all of their New York City operations into this Grand Train Hall. Um, we have a lot of obstacles. This um, project, the first phase of this project will not be completed until 2016. Um, and that's because this is the busiest train station in the nation and the, the railroads, although they're cooperating with this, unlike any cooperation in the past that really goes back to the work that the venture did with them, we can only do this at nights and weekends. Um, and cha uh, taking a track out in Penn Station even on a weekend is a very difficult thing to do. But we don't need to wait until this project is completed to begin building the Grand Train Hall. That work can, can, un can be started simultaneously. It'll take about four years to build the Grand Train Hall. So, but we have obstacles. Um, we've cobbled together $267 million, including the third largest Tiger grant or discretionary grant as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in the country, another $120 million in federal funds that go back into the late 90s, money from the Port Authority, money from the MTA that we've put together to get this first phase done. We now have to work on how do we put together the, um, the financing for the train station, we have to work with our partners on how do we develop the rest of the building with the retail and the other uses throughout those buildings and how that, which is very important for this panel, all fits into the context of the redevelopment of the far west side. So this really, I tried today really to sort of set the stage. The work we're going to be doing is essential for Moynihan Station to be developed, but you're not going to see it unless you're hanging around in Penn Station at 2 in the morning <laughs> to see people going. Um, the, the sort of phases of the work, we have about six months of work for um, Amtrak simply to move the Cantonary wiring that New Jersey Transit and the Northeast Quarter trains use so that we can expand the concourse. We have to hang the concourse under the underpinning of a 100-year-old building. Um, and, then we need, and then we need to locate six fan plants that are about the size of this stage um, and, and bring the power and the emergency power into there. So it's, very technical work, which is why I'm so fortunate to have the Port Authority as my partner in the development of this project, bringing their expertise, because this is the kind of work that the Port Authority is world-renowned for carrying out. So with that, Tom. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So this is my last slide. Can we go to the front of my presentation? This is actually the end of, of the one I put in. The other image of the region was the first. Let's see if we can get there. I'll, I'll say, as, as hopefully they're queuing that up, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank MAS for inviting me. I particularly appreciate Hugh's uh, introduction, since it's rare that you hear the words regional and effective used in the same sentence. So I, I thank you. Thank you, Hugh. My, my job here this morning is to talk, I think, to give a little bit of the regional context and perspective. So I thought I'd, I'd go back about 100 years and just talk about the regional infrastructure and the systems we have here to, to try and lay the, uh, the setting for, for where Moynihan fits in there. This is New York about 100 years ago uh, when RPA's first regional plan was produced. And it was a city and a region poised for enormous transformation and growth. Uh, the Manhattan waterfront was a working waterfront. Uh, we didn't have, you see, there's no Triborough Bridge. We didn't have all the connections to the rest of the metropolitan region that we had at the time. In the first half of the 20th century, we started to build out systems. Unfortunately, with the brilliance of Robert Moses and other people, it started mostly with the highway routes. Uh, and by 1963, this pr map was produced in, in 28, and by 63, the Verrazano Bridge was put in place, and essentially this highway system was built out. And, and the region, to a large degree, built around it. At the same time, there had been proposals for connecting the mass transit network that we had in this region. This was built, the seeds of this, the bones of this, were really built by the private sector in competing robber barons. And so that's why we don't have that one-seat ride between Grand Central and Penn Station today, is because they were built in competition with each other. And so we've known for... Uh, almost 100 years, what we need to do to kind of knit this system together and to build on it, but we've never really followed through 
uh, with this kind of work. And that's, I think, the challenge that we face today as we do this. We've been left with an extraordinary array of infrastructure in this region. Uh, as Hugh talked about earlier, Newark, uh, LaGuardia, and Kennedy airports thought of as a single system, over 100 million a annual passengers a year go through our region's airports. And the competing uh, air traffic patterns and systems really kind of limit what we can do. Ken Jackson likes to say, when you're driving along the New Jersey Turnpike right around here, and you've got the Eastern Seaboard's largest uh, seaport on over one shoulder, and, uh, and Newark Airport over the other, and just on the other side of that, the Northeast Corridor of Amtrak, you're probably sitting in the greatest concentration of infrastructure on the planet. You are sitting there at the most accessible uh, centralized location on the entire planet. Um, so we have this incredible system, and in particular, of course, when we talk about transit, about our subways and commuter rail, uh, almost half of the transit ridership in the United States is happening here in New York in this metropolitan region. And Penn Station at its center is the largest transit hub in the entire nation. Uh, so that's the kind of the, the scale and the system that we're talking about. Uh, and that's what we need to try and figure out how to upgrade, how to modernize, how to knit together these pieces. In 96 at RPA, we proposed these, the big three projects. Uh, the Second Avenue subway, east side access to bring uh, Long Island Railroad to Grand Central, and access to the region's core. And I'm sure it's been alluded to uh, earlier this morning, but when I was invited to give this talk just a couple weeks ago, I was going to be able to say all three of these projects were underway. Uh, pr sometime this afternoon or maybe next week, unfortunately, it looks like Governor Christie is probably going to cancel access to the region's core. It is the most unbelievably, astoundingly short-sighted decision I've ever seen a public official make. Uh, this one tunnel doubles the entire capacity of the New Jersey uh, uh, mass commuter system. It is, it is just a horrible choice. Uh, over the last 20 years, 80%, 89%, I'm sorry, of the new commuters coming into Manhattan have been coming from west of the Hudson River. Uh, the growth of this district on the west side which I'll finish with. I, I call this what Vishan hath wrought. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, this extraordinary system. And when we look at all of the projects that, that have been happening here, we know that to do this, what we need to do is we need to build on that lifeblood, that heart that pumps the economy of this region. And that is the transit network and the systems that connect it. And access to the region's core is really a critical part of it. Um, Moynihan Station, of course, sitting at the heart of it, is also the piece. One of the things we've always known is that development in New York City does not leapfrog. It moves incrementally. That districts expand on their edge and they grow out. And Moynihan, if you think about the 42nd and 34th Street corridors, Moynihan is the pivotal piece, the catalyst, in starting to trigger the redevelopment of this entire area. And so, so we see this as a central piece, both in a vast regional system and here at the core of this district. Uh, I'm, I'm rushing through this, but I want to get to questions and answers, so I'll just leave it there, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Oh, you think you want? John? I want to talk a little about what do we do to get to uh, 2016. Let's see what we've got. But first, we try to turn on this slide. Look, it's a bad time, and maybe we just want to rest to 2016, but the fact of the matter is, is that New York has always built most of its infrastructure during bad economic times. The George Washington Bridge, the Croton Aqueduct System, the American Museum of Natural History, the Queens and Midtown Tunnel, these were all things that we committed ourselves to that have vastly improved, as Tom just uh, demonstrated to us, uh, our capacity to grow, why we're the leading city. <coughs> Let's talk about the, the great area, the Hudson Yards, the area that is under discussion. Large, all those people that come through Penn Station every day, very few of them have ever been west of 8th Avenue. This is an area that appears to be the world headquarters of, of infrastructure with rail yards and highways, spaghetti and bus garages, but in fact, it's unreachable. Uh, here it is, 300 acres, just to put it in scale. But it's hard to, the, what we're contemplating building here, why am I doing 
hard for everybody to say. What we're contemplating building here is, in fact, the equivalent of two downtown Detroits. So this, this is a huge new city that we have the capacity, we hope, uh, to build on the west side. Don't worry. Oh, OK, great. Yeah. yeah. So look, let's look quickly at the assets of, of the west side. One, of course, is the river, as Hugh said. That's the new reality that people are drawn to the river, real estate's drawn to the river. Uh, we have Great Hudson River Park very nearby. This, the other is the great retail center of, of New York, uh, close by uh, Times Square, uh, not far away, not tantalizingly close, but not far away. All the, the, the Port Authority bringing in uh, people, the energy of, of, of Midtown, uh, represented here by Bryant Park, one of the great central business district. Uh, more recently, assets are the soon to be completed, let, let's say within the time frame that we're discussing, uh, number seven line, and of course the extraordinary uh, high line which has been celebrated and can't be celebrated enough for its energy and, and vision. Uh, and finally, the centerpiece of uh, Moynihan Station. It's very interesting, as Tom said, and, and as Tim said, this should be the, this is the big asset, this is the centerpiece of our planning, but actually it's, it's only recently been so. In fact, it was largely ignored in, in cities' recent planning. Uh, there, there were, let's say, other goals and other, other visions for the west side of which this was a, a bit player, but it's coming in uh, to its own. And we can look now for inspiration to the other side of town, to, to, to Grand Central, not for architecture, but for the vision of covering over a rail yard. For what happens when you take advantage of all the people coming through Grand Central, you pave over and you create a city within a city. And that's the promise, of course, of, of the far west side. Uh, there are some issues or problems with what we mean to do. It's great to have uh, the Javits uh, Convention Center there, uh, but of course with the Javits Convention Center, which is now patching its roof and not expanding, uh, come probably the greatest concentration of bad parking problems in the nation. And just imagine uh, when Add, add to these trucks the, the buses that come in on Wednesdays with the people for the matinees, and then all the, all the traffic that will be generated out of Hudson Yards, you're <clears throat> sooner or later, somebody, somebody's going to have to deal with Javits, and we think it should be dealt with now. Not, it's not just a design problem. It really probably shouldn't be located here. There is the spaghetti, the wonderful spaghetti that feeds the Port Authority, but it also cuts uh, Midtown Manhattan off from the lower west, from the, the west side that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here we are, here are, here are the elements that, that, that we were, uh, Tom was, was just describing to us. And I think basically the biggest problem that this area has is it is not yet adequately connected to the assets that we were talking about. It doesn't connect with 42nd Street, it doesn't connect particularly effectively yet with existing transportation. It doesn't really connect yet effectively the far west uh, to the shopping district. It doesn't really yet, it's not assured that it's gonna be connect, connected properly to the High Line, and it's not really yet connected to Hudson River Park. There's a high potential, obviously, for all those, and very bright people from Vichon years ago to the city planning today that I think are trying to work on that, but we have to be pushing them to work, work on those things. <clears throat> the, and then finally, there's the 39th Street Ferry, which at least the current plans uh, wall off uh, from, from the city. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, one idea uh, that's been on the table a long time came from Senator Moynihan, was to have some sort of uh, uh, east-west rail connection from the UN of, over, over to the Hudson River. Uh, that's still a, a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> when Moynihan was talking about it, uh, they were talking about uh, light rail and Fred Pappert, but uh, more recently, the bus rapid transit is, is on the table. I think Moynihan would have been so excited yesterday to have met Jeanette Sadat Khan and see that sort of high energy approach that is being brought to, uh, to her transportation issues. 
uh, there ought to be a way to get from uh, 9th Avenue to the theater district to the ferry terminal, 39th Street's lying there empty of traffic, but at least at the moment, the plan for the area is to create a bus garage right in the way of that uh, potential pedestrian way. That, without dwelling on all the limitations or the issues, here's the Great Hudson River Park, but this is the skinniest part. It's so narrow. It's about the width of this platform in this area. It needs to be expanded. Uh, the pier that is the, the allegedly going to be a public pier is still a tow pound, and nobody's made any move uh, to, to, uh, to move that tow pond. Javits blocks everything and when, it, when it expands, or if there's a bus garage for blocks, cutting this whole new neighborhood off from the river. The Hudson River Boulevard, which is a nice idea, unfortunately, ends not very dramatically in the spaghetti over, over the, uh, <coughs> the Port Authority. And the High Line, the Great High Line, uh, coming up here right now, I, I hope it's assured that it's going to be part of Hudson Yards, but then sort of dies inelegantly uh, nowhere in the middle of 34th Street. Somehow it's going to be bridged over uh, to the uh, to Hudson, Hudson River Park. Uh, another issue is uh, who's in charge here anyway. And uh, everything in yellow, the Moynihan, the Yards, the Javits, the MTA, the Port Authority, are really in the hands of whoever is going to get elected in, in the next couple of weeks with a new cast that will come in. And uh, it's always an issue with the city. I mean, the city worked it out, I think, intelligently at Governor's Island by suggesting to the state it's better to have one leader than two. Uh, I'm not suggesting who should be in charge here, but this is too valuable to leave subject to the usual Macy's and Gimbel's activities of whoever is mayor and who was ever governor. So there ought to be some governance structure for this whole area. Uh, there was a great vision. This is McKim's vision, the first vision as far as I know, to create a great white city on the west side. It did not happen. And uh, one wonders, yesterday was really wonderfully reassuring in terms of demonstrating to us that New York has taken the lessons of Jane Jacobs. It has applied it on the street corner, in the neighborhoods, on the waterfront, in the transportation systems. We really get pretty good marks these days for what we're doing with individual buildings or with uh, you know, re retrofitting neighborhoods. But we don't get very good marks yet for our, lar our capacity at large-scale development. This is Rockefeller Center to remind us that it's a standard that we, ha we have a hard time meeting. Why is that? Well, in my view, I'm not sure what it is. It should be the subject of another two-day summit then. But one, one reason is, is that we have diminished the capacity of our public authorities. Uh, this is not a slam at Tim, Tim Gilchrist, who is the hero of bringing Moynihan back on the station. But basically, there are no Ed Logues in, in the picture at the moment. There are no Robert Moseses. And I'm not talking now about arrogance. I'm talking about uh, capacity. When during World War II, Bob Moses kept, he never let any of his designers or architects go into the service. They stayed up 24 hours a day drawing the plans Moses knew at the end of the war somebody would fund those plans and we got 70% of the money. There are not people working today in the state of New York uh, making those plans. Another, another interesting thing, it seems to me, is that while the capacity for public interaction has picked up, wit witness the presentations we had yesterday, we have made our public participation processes more cumbersome than ever. All, most large-scale projects are undertaken by the state with no local, no local review. We've been very timid about wanting to engage the public. I think we're still afraid of the public in New York, and I think uh, that hurts us. And finally, as, was, as came up at the initial moment yesterday, and something that I hope will come out of this summit, is that we have an unbelievably cumbersome, wasteful, and expensive public approval process based on environmental reviews that we rely on develop developers to provide. To a large extent, we've been relying on developers 
uh, to provide not only the infrastructure that the public should be providing, but even the money to fund the EISs. And, ma and matching, at least for my money, speaking only as an individual, bad as the seeker processes are, I think the ULERT processes are, are not good. I think, what they, I think that the communities have been invited to scream and have lost any real power to affect processes. In any case, we're not really getting the consensus and, and the community discussion we need to move things along. Um, Pat Moynihan was, had two great qualities, it seems to me. One was his vision, of course, uh, which we'll come back to, but the other was his impatience. And during the time that the city was fumbling the first generation of ideas of creating rapid transit across 42nd Street, he said in frustration it made, it made him yearn for the days when Boss Croker could build the IRT as a favor to a friend. Uh, he would probably have been furious to find that we're now talking about two th 2016, but never mind, we're moving forward. But the other thing that Pat Moynihan had w was vision. And I think that this what's so encouraging about this summit and the participation in it is that his spirit, I think, I hope, will pervade what we're going to do in the next few years. And when they ask, I think the day of this photograph, what his thoughts were about the, what would New York be like after Moynihan Station was completed? He said, well, it will be different, it will be better, it will be magnificent. Those are the qualities and the standards we have to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Deshaun. Uh, overjoys me when Ken Farwick says, if you look at uh, the Hudson Yards, it's two Detroits, and he shows two images with stadia in them. <laughs> right, but that for another panel. <laughs> Uh, you know, my former boss, Dan Doktoroff, would kill me for coming up here without a PowerPoint, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, and maybe, maybe a wiser decision this morning, but there we go. Um, MAS asked me to talk about a larger context in terms of why a project like Moynihan is essential, and I'm going to try to do that very quickly and just, just put it this way. Um, you know, in 2001, the University of Chicago did a study that basically said that 50% of the gross domestic product of the United States is generated on 2% of its landmass. Right, kind of an extraordinary figure to think about. Half of our economic output generated by 2% of our landmass. Right, uh, conversely, about 50% of our landmass generates about 2% of our gross domestic product. That same study found that staggeringly, that New York City generates one and a half billion dollars per square mile of our GDP. So what's interesting to me about this project and why it's so essential is that, you know, I think the project was conceived out of the pure embarrassment that is Penn Station today. But I think what it probably underestimated was its own power as a symbol for the way in which we can tie both environmentalism and economic development forward going into the future and set a standard not just for New York City, not just for the region, but for the entire nation. Because as you look around the nation, what's very, very clear is that the places that are in the most distress are the places that are the least dense and that have economic monocultures right, where you see foreclosure after foreclosure, whereas you see city after city, and this is true worldwide, right, where the denser we are, the healthier we are, right, and that the key, therefore, is to tie that transportation, that density, to make this all work together. So given that, I just want to now talk about Moynihan in that context, because understanding Moynihan in terms of civic architecture, great civic architecture, right, and as a gateway into our city, has been necessary but not sufficient. In a city with a transportation wish list of some $30 billion, right? The notion that we're going to spend a billion dollars plus on a new gateway for Amtrak has simply not resonated to the larger public to the extent that we need it to resonate, 
right? And that is, I think, part of why it has taken well over 15 years. What's been fascinating this morning is this, if you go through the presentations, almost every presenter has a different design version of Moynihan Station, right? And do you know why? Because it's been going and going and going for 15 years. In 1999, we had a front page article in the New York Times, right, that showed just this beautiful station that was $300 million over budget. Right? We simply do not live in a time right, where through inspiring design, we're going to have a senator from Oklahoma who is going to rain down billions of dollars so we can build a magnificent new gateway into our station. We have to think about it much more holistically, and I think that process has finally begun. Right? Um, and, so, um, and I was very happy at the groundbreaking to see Secretary LaHood emphasize high-speed rail, that high-speed rail would come to the Farley building uh, under the Obama administration. Clearly, if Governor Christie ever becomes president, he'll revive the Lower Manhattan Expressway. Um, <laughs> what the hell did Jane Jacobs know, right? Um, so I would say beyond civic architecture and beyond this notion of a great gateway for inner city rail, I think we have to think about four other factors to really think holistically about the entire neighborhood that Kent just presented to you, right? That includes additional rail capacity, which Tom spoke to so eloquently. The commuter station, and this is very important, I want to talk about this in a minute, right? The surrounding neighborhood and the fourth overarching factor, which is how we pay for all of this, right? So the original plans for Farley never really addressed these four factors. It was really about getting a new inner city rail station. Um, so let's go through these factors one by one. Capacity, we clearly need ARC. If ARC dies today, we have to bring it back tomorrow. It is the most critical piece of regional infrastructure we can build, right? Every one of us has to go out there and fight to do that, right? And ARC can be better tied to Penn Station. There are things in which we can improve our ARC, get the cost down, there are things we can do. East side access is critical to divert some Long Island Railroad to Grand Central, and at some point, we should actually have the sanity to bring Long Island Railroad and New Jersey Transit trains through Penn Station, not deadheaded Penn Station, so we don't have enormous train parking lots sitting in the middle of New York City. That's not where they belong, right? Second, the commuter station. And this, we're all responsible for this one, okay? The vaunted McKim Mead and White Station treated commuters like second-class citizens, and frankly, almost every plan for Moynihan Station has treated commuters like second-hand citizens. It has always been about Amtrak. The thing is, we may scurry like rats into the existing station, but we scurry like the same rat whether we carry a $9 ticket or a $90 ticket. And we have to solve that holistic problem, right? So it's not just about getting Amtrak into Farley. It is about when, when, Ken, when uh, Hugh stands here and tells you that there are uh, more passengers moving through Penn Station than the three airports, well, 25,000 of those passengers are Amtrak. The remaining 525 are commuters, right? So if we spend a billion dollars putting Amtrak in Farley and 525,000 people wake up the next morning to the same sorry lot that they go through every single day, that is not sufficient, I would argue. I think we have to do more than that. The neighborhood. Now, people have spoken about the neighborhood. After this event, when you get some fresh air, I would invite you to walk around this neighborhood, right? Don't just look at Farley. Don't just look at Madison Square Garden. Look at the entire neighborhood um, that surrounds the, you know, just the three blocks that are around Penn Station. And ask yourself whether that is the neighborhood that is befitting the surrounding, right, the busiest transportation hub in the Western Hemisphere. Right? If you look at those same blocks around Grand Central, what does it mean? It means that the vast majority of people come into Grand Central and they walk to their destination. They don't get on the number six to go up to 51st and Park. They walk up a beautiful boulevard and they walk to their destination. And I'm so happy when Ben in his opening comments today talked about the fact that if we develop this neighborhood in the right way, we can create a series of destinations for people as soon as they come out of Penn Station, and that, I think, is going to be critical as we move forward to make this whole area competitive, sustainable, and livable. Um, now, the fourth factor, how we pay for all of this, right? We need a new station at Farley. We need the proper connections for ARC. We need to improve the commuter station. We need to change the neighborhood. So how do we pay for all of that? I don't believe that soaring architecture in and of itself is going to inspire people to pay for all of that. So look, 
reasonable infrastructure is a public responsibility. It first and foremost falls on the public sector to figure out how to do this, and I really compliment him for quietly working away at this, not just in terms of getting the first phase done, but also in terms of getting Amtrak to agree to move into Farley. But government can't do it alone. This has to be a public-private partnership. The developers, I think, very much would like to do the right thing here. And I think the civic organizations and the editorial boards and so forth are critical, and the community board are absolutely critical in working in alliance to make sure that the right kind of development happens in conjunction with the station. Grand Central has a tremendous amount of retail space in it. It's very functional space, and it's part of what makes Grand Central work. It is unfair to say that this is part of what led to the demise of Penn Station, but when you think about the original McKim Station, nine acres, right, with virtually no economic drivers in it. And in fact, it's McKim, Eden, White fought those economic drivers, right? There is an argument that could be made that we could have that station today if those economic drivers were in place. So we have to stop thinking so politically in this, these black and white terms about what is good and what is bad and actually think together about how development in terms of retail, how development around the station can help to fund all this vital infrastructure. So I'm going to close now and I'm just going to say we have to go forward in manageable phases and I compliment the state for doing this in manageable phases. But if we're going to get to our end goal, we have to think about a holistic vision with both the mayor and the governor, the new governor, playing vital partnership roles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Four very dynamic presentations. Thank you, gentlemen, please come back up here. Could I get some chairs for these guys? Thank you for putting the mics out. I don't want to gobble up my whole time here asking questions from the moderator because I know how passionate people are about this issue, and we didn't have enough time uh, for our questions from all of you yesterday, so we don't want to make the same mistake. Um, I will get out one or two, though. There are so many ways I could go based on those presentations. So I'm just sort of shuffling the deck here, you know, and I've made changes already to my own questions. Um, but I guess I just have to get this out one more time. Um, you each raised it, and that is ARC. So what if ARC is dead dead? Tim? Um, it, in my view, it's tells us we have to move Moynihan Station faster. Um, as Deshaun just talked about, we've got to deal with what the commuters experience is every day in Penn Station. And while those 25,000 Amtrak passengers are not a um, the high percentage of the users, there are a high percentage of the problem in the use of the space. And then we, as Deshaun said, we, ha we have to have more capacity across the, across the river. So we've got to go back and figure out how to do it. But we've got to move the people out and move the station. Anyone else? <coughs> no. well, maybe we should do the obvious with the 525,000 people who are not Amtrak, who live in <coughs> many of whom commute from New Jersey. I don't know if there's been an effort, uh, Tom, to recruit those riders. <coughs> But the, a small number of highly motivated people can sometimes make yeah. change. I, I was handing out leaflets uh, from 7 to 9 a.m. earlier this week <laughs> uh, at the Princeton Junction. I am one of those rats who scuttles through the station every day. Uh, um, what do we do without ARC? Well, first of all, there will be about $3 billion of Port Authority funding that was earmarked for it that will be available for other regional infrastructure projects. And so whether that's Moynihan Station, whether that's a path extension to Newark Airport, there are a lot of other very good competing priorities there. I think we all ought to make sure it doesn't go to widening the New Jersey Turnpike south of uh, Mercer County. Uh, there are about $3 billion of federal funds that are uh, dedicated to ARC right now. We know that folks around the country are already sharpening their knives and looking for that. We ought to make sure to try and grab that money for the New York region also and put that again towards Moynihan or other regional infrastructure needs. And then I think Vashon said it very well. If it does die this afternoon or sometime early next <coughs> week, we ought to, we start the next day trying to revive it. You know, it's very, very hard to do large scale infrastructure projects. And people like to talk very often about how many times Second Avenue subway has had the pull, plug pulled on it. At RPA, I guess we also like to point out that every time it's come back again. And we are going to need the capacity under the Hudson River. New Jersey has a hard cap on the number of people who can commute into New York right now. And so 
arc will come back in some other form. And so the day after it, um, it, it gets killed, we'll, we'll probably start working on trying to revive it in one form or another. I would only add that I think that there are ways to improve ARC to get it to be more uh, of what, you know, look, we are in hard times. Uh, I think there are ways to bring the cost down. I think there are ways to better connect it to Penn Station. And I think there are ways to, therefore, make a stronger argument for the necessity for ARC. But ultimately, I think it's inevitable because New Jersey's run out of space. It's the densest state in America, and it's run out of space. And that means that all the growth in New Jersey is going to happen on the Northeast Corridor. And so I think it's just inevitable. I Tom. Make two. There, there have been, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done is, I mean, again, Second Avenue Subway being a good example here. You know, uh, at RPA, we want to see a full build Second Avenue that runs the length of Manhattan. What has been done is it's been broken down into pieces, into phases. And it's already been identified how one and a half billion dollars could be taken out of ARC. Things like a rail switching yard in Kearney, uh, some of the exits. You know, there are things that should be part of it that can be, maybe we can make it more digestible. I want to just Put the, the, the Penn Station connection is one that's currently being used. Even Governor Christie is talking about why do we need a station into the basement of, of Macy's, a, a tunnel into the basement of Macy's. So I just want to put out there that that's a false issue. I mean, first of all, the reason ARC is in trouble today is not because of flaws with the project. It's because the governor doesn't have funding for the Transportation Trust Fund. He doesn't want to raise the gas tax to pay for fixing roads and bridges. And so he wants to take transit money and switch it. And when people talk about we can fix ARC and make it a better project, they are simply playing into the trap that the governor set. The governor is not looking to improve ARC. He's not looking at cost overruns. He's not looking at those things. He's looking to take the money and switch it to roads. And so, and that's one thing. The other is the Penn Station connection uh, would be good. It certainly is. But when people say people want to go to Penn Station instead of Macy's, the answer is they don't want to go to either of those. They're coming, to, they're getting to their jobs. I mean, that's where they're trying <clears throat> to go. I don't take the train in so that I can hang around Penn Station all day. I take it. <laughs> And they're I'm, going to the subway. And but they're, they're going to the and subway. And they're going to the subway. Right. And, and ARC and, has connections to the subway. And many of them, some of them, are walking over to Herald Square to get to the end of the R. And the fact that ARC is further east than Penn Station is actually an improvement. And so, and so just kind of, I, I want to put those two issues out there very squarely on the table again. What's happening with ARC is not a deficiency in the program that was put forward today. It's about the governor keeping a promise not to raise gas taxes and shifting the funds from transit <coughs> largely to roads. And I just want to right. reiterate that. Thank you, Tom. I, I'd like to ask a question about federal policy, but I won't. Um, but after many years in Washington, it it's, uh, would be a pet issue. But uh, instead, I want to go to livability, uh, because this is a livability conference after all. And by the way, uh, the microphones are up in both aisles, and we're going to go a little bit over because of the, the, uh, the nature of this discussion, but just a few minutes. So those asking questions, if you could keep your questions concise, if you may, uh, so that we can get in a few, that would be great. Okay, let's focus on livability. We've been speaking about the issue all day, and this project obviously has great livability implications. Improving access to transportation, creating a beautiful, iconic space, and fostering a vibrant neighborhood are all factors that should, should improve the experience of living in New York City. What are the certain livability impacts of this project? What are the likely impacts? What's missing from the project that might be included to truly enhance the experience of using or living around Moynihan Station for New Yorkers? You've all touched on the subject of livability. Kent, Bashan? I think Making those connections, looking at the open space issues is, is one index of livability. And unfortunately, I think at least that the, so far the open space planning has been not as fully developed to be nice as, as it could be. And, and there's a deficit of, of open space. So when you begin to think about the, the Jane Jacobs criteria that were so much on the table yesterday, apply those to that neighborhood. Uh, th there are issues of scale, there are issues of how much affordable housing there's going to be. But I think the big overriding issue for me is connecting to the other assets of this area. I would just say, you know, uh, since 2000, the number of children under five living in Manhattan has increased by 50%, right? That is a livability metric, 
right? And it has to do with the fact that most people, if they can figure it out, don't want to take their kids to the soccer game in a minivan in 40 minutes of traffic, right? That's not the way I think more and more people want to live differently and want to use mass transit to get where they're going. And so I think the core livability issue here is how do we create great places, as our predecessors did, around clusters of transportation. And we frankly have, uh, have gone backwards, both, and from my perspective, from both the political right and the political left in understanding this issue in the last 100 years, right? And it's actually uh, uh, taken away from our livability Right, as opposed to the way our predecessors understood these issues. And I, I, I find that kind of remarkable. All right, let's move on. Thank you. Um, we have a question on the right. George Hyde Collins, right. Institute Rational Urban Mobility. Uh, the, uh, I think our organization would take exception to what Tom said about uh, the deep cavern station under 34th Street. That's not livability in our view as transit rider advocates. We think we should come into Penn Station and continue on to Grand Central as was studied by Parsons Brinkerhoff in 2003. And that plan can be built into two phases. Get into Penn, phase one, resume the planning for Grand Central, which was quite elaborate and quite extensive and stopped when New Jersey Transit wanted to go its own way. So I guess my question is, would you support restarting the Penn Station Grand Central component of the ARC study? Uh, there were, there, the, <laughs> I, th I, I think I already answered that. Uh, there, there were fatal flaws uh, with, with bringing it into Penn Station, and the project that's going ahead right now is one that could be extended to Grand Central. <clears throat> There's this thing called the Third Water Tunnel that's chugging its way south down Manhattan, and it, for another 10 years until that's finished, nothing is going to be crossing uh, from west to east across Manhattan. So the current project was designed and engineered in a way so that it could be eventually extended over to Grand Central in a second phase. And I think that's the answer. Anyone else? Okay, to the left. Roberta. Um, something scares me about the future plan. The building plan to replace oh. the one we are standing in grew enormously with a seemingly up uh, um, unnecessary, unexplained upzoning. And when you talk about having to pay for all of this wonderful project of Moynihan Station um, with the development, are we talking about buildings of the scale that uh, will replace this? And if we are, let's make that part of the conversation instead of surprising us after we have endorsed a plan that then gives us Shanghai. I love Shanghai. Um, um, I agree with you, actually. I think there needs, uh, and I think the city really needs to take the lead on this because it's in the city's um, jurisdiction there needs to be a comprehensive plan for the redevelopment of this area. Um, and it needs to be, it needs to go through a public process, it needs to, you know, and it needs to be understood. I disagree with my friend Ken a little bit in that I actually think there are parts of the Euler process that actually are remarkably better than anything else that exists in the country. That doesn't mean it can't be better. But um, I don't think, you know, whereas I actually believe the redevelopment of this site is very important as a first step towards a larger redevelopment of this area, I do agree that there needs to be a comprehensive plan. I, I obviously second that, and I think it's a, a great to hear it. And the, the, the developers have to be at the table. You can't do something that's economically unrealistic or else nobody will build, and nobody built the McKim plan. Uh, but the, the leadership has to be public at the table uh, with a cap P, and the third force at the table has to be the, the community. We have a very talented uh, community board here. Uh, it's done wonderful work. Uh, they have done professional planning that is comparable to what small cities in America have done. There needs to be a, a consensus building, reality-driven process. I'd like to just go ahead, Tom. Uh, just one comment. I, I, I think that 
Chris Ward likes to show a slide, I'm sure some of the people in the room have seen it, of the old Holland Tunnel, where there was a 50 cent toll and there was, and there's a sign in the background that, that advertises for a hotel room in Manhattan for $2.50. And he talks about there was an economic model that we used to finance our infrastructure 100 years ago. And it was essentially user fees paying for the big systems that we're talking about. That model is dying. And, and the issue that Roberta brought up is, I think, going to become increasingly important because more and more we know that the value that this infrastructure investments creates is in the real estate of the surrounding neighborhood. We did a study of ARC looking at what, what happens when you improve the transit uh, access for New Jersey residents into, lower men, into, into Midtown. And, uh, and we, based a, we created a model that looked at previous capital investments and the kind of time savings that they created and proximity to train stations and residential home values. And it, it showed that ARC would create $18 billion in additional wealth of New Jersey homeowners. East Side Access will probably do just about the same thing to people living out in the middle of Long Island today. We don't have an economic model in place right now to capture some of that value, but I think the only way we're gonna build these projects is if we figure that out. And I think that highlights that issue, which is there needs to be a public understanding of that relationship, and there needs to be a discussion early and forthright and openly about that relationship. So because that's going to become, if, if, if you think it's been important here in, in the building that'll someday replace this one, I think it's only going to become a larger and larger issue in the future. Just do real quickly, this is, the place it has been done is the number seven line. Absolutely. Right, where we did capture the value of the new development and that's why we have a subway under construction under, um, underneath right. the west side of Manhattan. So there is a model. Well, also a Thank you, no, I'm a, one last question. I'm sorry, because uh, we really are way over. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Jack Eichenbaum, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Queensboro historian. Uh, Bichon, thank you for bringing up the fact that we can bring trains from New Jersey into Long Island. It was designed that way. The, the Pennsylvania Railroad bought the Long Island Railroad to create the, pen, the, pen, uh, the um, Sunnyside Yards, which are probably closer to Midtown East than this is. And the Sunnyside Yards offer another potential to build another railroad station that would unify transportation in Long Island City, intermodal to connect, Queen, the, uh, to connect Amtrak, Long Island Expressway even, if it felt like doing that with a, somehow an exit from the expressway, and the subway system so that people from Long Island who are going to New England don't have to go into Manhattan to catch their train. This was proposed a number of years ago. I don't know where it stands. Can anybody speak to this larger element of regional transportation where we have a, another intermodal station on the other side of the river? I, I think that would be a wonderful place to put a convention center, too. No, I'm going to say that. <laughs> 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 and I have one that I think needs moving. So. <laughs> Jacob Yavitz loved the Sunnyside Yards. <laughs> you also raised an interesting point. It, it didn't, the, the press really didn't pick it up, but when Amtrak a few weeks ago put out its, I don't know how many billion dollar vision for um, high speed rail in the Northeast Quarter, they talked a, a little bit about a second Manhattan station. And I think it goes to your point, should that be in Manhattan or is that farther out to, to take away some of that congestion? Thank you, thank you. This has been a tremendously provocative discussion. We could easily go on another hour. Uh, Tim, Kent, Bashan, Tom, thank you so, so much. Thanks to all of you. I think we're going to a break. Am I right or no? We're going right into the next panel. See? Okay. We are, <laughs> some of us. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.